hour here, so we need to get going. Most of you know me. I'm Mary Beth Rawson, the Associate Dean, and I'm happy to be hosting this celebratory occasion. And I'm also really happy to see all the unfamiliar faces out here, which is a sign, I think, of what impact this man has had in his career here and over his whole life, really, as it turns out. Um, but first, I want to uh, introduce some of you to, and for others of you, simply remind you of the generosity of George McMurtry and his lovely wife, Margaret, who come to visit with us every year as part of this celebration. They are, of course, the, uh, the inspiration behind the McMurtry Teaching Award, which comes with um, not just the recognition and celebration that we're having today, but also a monetary um, award. Ed will mm. get $500 to do what he wants. He can buy more <laughs> trick-or-treating candy. <laughs> if there's that. cost, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he also will get $500 to spend on even more teaching innovations. And of course, he will get this lovely lion, yeah. which is up here. So all of that comes thanks to, to George to uh, a uh, superior master teacher that we identify every year. So let's thank the McMurtry. <laughs> and now I'll introduce the man of the hour. But uh, before I do that, I think there's somebody sitting up there in the back who wants to say just a few words. <laughs> Tim. <laughs> just a few words. been a while, yeah. yeah. And, um, Ed and I were in the same scout troop together in college. And uh, George came into the scout the same night in 1972. Uh, I was working in Northern Comfort. And Ed was very patient to have me because he was a wonderful person to be around. And mm. thoughtful and uh, caring. Caring person. And this, this uh, Eagle Scout thing seems to run pretty deeply because we have young man. Oh, I'm Bob Houts. I was, excuse my voice, I don't have a cold, but I had laser surgery on my throat. But I was a scout master and, and Ed, and Ed, he was my Eagle Scout. <laughs> but, but more than... I happened to work with, with, with George McMurtry or Dean McMurtry at the time for about 15 years over in College of Engineering. So isn't this amazing? It's like full circle or <laughs> small world or amazing people or something like that. Anyway, all of that is just icing on the cake for us because what I really want to do is introduce Ed, who, as you know, if you saw the flyer, has been with Penn State for quite some time in SMEO before he came over here where he does many things at the gradu graduate level and the undergraduate level. So he works in uh, enterprise architecture is that right? Yeah, yeah. enterprise architecture, yeah. uh, part of the graduate program and teaches mm -hmm. master's students and so on, but mm -hmm. he teaches many more undergraduate students, and that really is what we are <laughs> recognizing today, the, the tremendous impact he has on people like Sage, see? Sage is daughter of Tim, right? And she's one of our uh, SRA students. So, um, so anyway, we have lots of reasons to love Ed, and I will read to you this is what's going it, it's oh. not on the this is what's going to be on the plaque okay this is what we're going to put on the plaque uh, ed glance brings a key insight to into his teaching smarter together in each class he invites students to be part of a learning community that emphasizes shared work and participation in the larger group over the years he has innovated many different techniques for bringing peer learning into the student experience including team projects, minute surveys, and discussion boards. The result is better student engagement, active learning, and success. So with that, let's welcome Ed. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, maybe we'll need it later, yeah. No, not right now. Thank you very much for that introduction, Mary Beth. So what I'm gonna talk about today is something that I've been working on for years, and it's not done yet, and some of what I'm going to talk about, you're going to say, well, what's interesting about that? What makes it interesting is the combination and then where I use it. I tend to use it in large section 
classes to make the sections seem smaller, and also gen ed sections, which are really difficult, where you have everyone <coughs> from a first semester student trying to figure out Penn State to a senior in electrical engineering. So it's, it's, a, it's more or less that cocktail. Um, I wrote about it in this wonderful book that Jack Carroll put together. He was recognized in the college that we have some really innovative teaching taking place, and he had us uh, faculty contribute chapters together. And I wanted to just show you a snippet of some of the creative titles. Fred Fonseca and Larry, the Karate Kid <laughs> Method of Problem-Based Learning, and, and even David Ryder, the Sleepies of Gamification. So <laughs> the good news is those are available, I think, through the library. I think they're available through the library's data, Springer database. So. Um, another small connection, as Mary Beth uh, mentioned, Dean McMurtry was my dean when I was an engineering student here at Penn State, and Mrs. McMurtry was in Nurses Club with my wife, so this world just got <laughs> insanely <laughs> tiny very, very quickly. So thanks very much, and, the, and the, one of the reasons we're able to be here today was Dean McMurtry's uh, collaboration with Jim Thomas to help take an idea and turn it into a brick and mortar reality, and an online reality as well, so thanks very much for that. Um, I was putting this slide together about the previous McMurtry Award winners. Um, there's two observations I wanted to make. The first is that all of the people that have won this award have contributed to my teaching and have inspired and motivated me. So that's the one comment. And the other comment when I was putting this slide together was this quote from, from Dean Hall. And what, what it takes to be a good teacher isn't to win an award, it's to care about your students. And one thing about University Park in my years here is how passionate the faculty are. I tell the students, especially the new ones that come, how lucky they are to be at one of the greatest universities in the world because of that compassion. And so it's more than just this list, it's the people in Jack Carroll's book and it's all of our faculty who have helped to motivate me in what I'm doing. I have had a lot of years at Penn State. When I started, it was teaching graduate classes in the College of Business. I thought it was gonna be a one semester deal. It ended up continuing on beyond that and then, um, and then switching over to IST. And in that time, it's over 11,000 students. I'm, I, go, I keep track of all the metrics and study this stuff. And so you might say, how do you teach 11,000 students? Well, it's real easy. You teach 250 a semester, three semesters a year for 16 years. And Rosalie's nodding her head. She knows exactly <laughs> how you do this. Um, the other question is, why would you want to do this? Well, that's an easy one. No one starts out saying, my goal is volume. No one starts out doing it. That just kind of happens. And I wrote, um, I counsel a lot of students and advise them. And I put a lot of it into a book. And then um, Lisa Lenz and I revised the book and wrote it just for IST students. And I was trying to put another metric out. I think in tuition dollars, this is how much this represents over 16 <laughs> years. Um, which, which means, hopefully, I was providing value equivalent to that. Real, real uh, important. But this becomes the foundation for my teaching. And then, so you get comfortable, you get uh, knowledge about how to, how to do things, and then, then you can start to move beyond it. So there were four moments in my teaching career where I had major transformations in what I was doing and maybe what I needed to do was things a little different. The first one was soon after becoming a faculty member at Penn State. There were not very many fixed term faculty when I started in 99. I think it was less than 8% of the faculty at University Park were fixed term. We decided to start getting together for lunches just to commiserate together. <laughs> but what we started to do was talk about issues or problems that we were encountering and then it was amazing that no matter what issue we had, at least one or two other people had a solution for it. And at, at the end of that semester, we were much stronger faculty because of that interaction, that informal interaction. And Dean McMurtry was sharing a story where he had the same kind of peer activity with some of the associate deans at, at Penn State. IST, plug for IST, Lisa Lenz's effort does do teaching lunches and participate in those. They're a wonderful opportunity. Um, the second big juncture when it was when I discovered Bloom's taxonomy, and I have discovered and rediscovered this over and over again. Um, that was real important for me uh, to know what level I'm teaching at, because I'm teaching everything from students right out of high school all the way to graduate students. So you switch the level of learning, and it's real important that your learning objectives align with your ass assessment objectives, because faculty will drift. They'll teach at one level and assess at a much more difficult level. So. I, that helped me with that. The third was I had a dean. I won't go into details about how the dean did it, but she greatly incentivized fixed-term faculty to substantially increase their SRTEs massively. And so I said, well, I'm in the forum, so what am I going to do? So I did what researchers do. I went out and researched how to teach. And it turns out University Park has a treasure trove of advice and counsel and material on how to teach. 
Um, through one of those activities, I came across this book by Ken Bain, uh, Health and Human Development, had him come in as a guest speaker. I was in a, a class that Trier was teaching, and, and the HHD people said they had the speaker come in. So I didn't go to their event, but I got the guy's book, and it was a great book for me. And I really think it should be studied chapter by chapter with a small group of faculty, because when you read it, you'll say, well, this won't work for me. I have a large section or a small section. I'm doing this or that, but you can reflect on it. One thing that came out of this book for me is I have a course contract for students at the very beginning of the semester. You want to be in this class, you abide by this contract. Your confirmation agreement is by, I used to make them sign it, but then I realized, no, if you, if you stay enrolled, you're agreeing to it. And it's not onerous. I mean, it, and they look at it, it looks kind of innocent. But basically, it's setting up everything about this together, uh, we're smarter, that by um, motivating them to do things to improve peer learning in the room, not the least of which is the feedback. And, and I'll come back to that in a second. So that came from that book. And then, um, and then the fourth level was um, trying to take the large section classrooms to another level, to Business 2.0 in the classroom, Web 2.0, to Classroom 2.0. And how can we do that? So there's a lot of things, a lot of different pedagogies and things like that. So that was the next step, the next motivation. Um, community really hit me whenever I read this book, Economics, in 2008. It was basically a reflection of the change that was taking place in business, where instead of it being a client-vendor relationship, it was actually a partnership. People got together and created things like Linux. This gold mining company was bankrupt, and they just threw their data out to the world. They open sourced it and crowdsourced it, and then they, they became one of the most successful gold mining companies in the world because armchair analysts helped them figure out what they needed to do. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, why don't we do that in the classrooms? Isn't that also like a gold mine that we can, we can harvest for ideas? Um, so we create community through connections. So here's a bunch of connections that we can make. And all of us do this, all of us as instructors. Sometimes we don't realize we need to do it in hard places, like when we teach online, where you don't have face-to-face -face contact. You don't have those mingling in the room before and after class. And one of the things they encourage us to do in those environments is to facilitate uh, relationships between students, introductions, video introductions, and so on. It also puts a lot of pressure on me to connect with teaching. Student gener you teach this long, 16 years. Students go through generational cycles every, what, three to five years or something, and they change. They change on how they learn. They change in their strengths and their weaknesses, and you have to be sensitive to that and change with them. The technologies change. This is a little snapshot of the technologies that I've been through. Just in the last year, the technologies have exploded and gone through the roof, and they're a little bit intimidating to me right now, <laughs> but that's real important too. That's why I can't teach the way I was taught. I have to teach the way we're in the environment, the situation we're in today. And the same thing with pedagogies. They're, they're changing all the time as well. And I think uh, it's good for us to try to experiment with, with different pedagogies. Some pictures of community. Uh, the nice thing about cell phones, you don't have to drag a camera around. You can just take them wherever. I just want to talk about a couple of these pictures here. First is just a plug. I'm going to miss this sign when it gets removed because this is these are the LEAP students right out of high school in the summer. First day on Penn State campus, I drag them all outside and take a picture. It's, I'm also subtly suggesting if you don't like the degree that you're going into, remember us, we're a friendly, <laughs> homey kind of place. And, and we do attract a few back, I think. So that's, I'll miss that sign. I'll have to figure out something, uh, some alternative. Another way to connect uh, or create community is by connections with prior students. This is, this is a first year student who had had LEAP the prior year. And he was on campus this summer and I said, I do brown bag lunches with the students in the summer. We just go into Reese's Cafe, anyone wants to show up, whatever you want to talk about, where sometimes I have guest speakers. And so Tim was here this summer and I said, you want to be a guest speaker? And I will leave you guys alone. So this is me taking the picture, walking up the steps. I just wanted to have a private conversation. Like, is this what this guy's telling you, fall and spring is going to be like? Is it true? Is it the real deal? So they had a private conversation. This one was also this summer. I don't know if any of you remember Houston Hunt. He was, Houston Hunt was a LEAP student of mine. He worked me, with me as an LA every semester as an undergraduate. He came back as a LEAP mentor his second summer, just a real hardworking kid. Houston and two other of our alumni just completed Carnegie Mellon's real rigorous two-year cybersecurity degree. And he came back this summer, and I, and I went to the LEAP students, and I said, for our brown bag lunch this week, you can meet Mr. Robot. Are you familiar with the TV show, Mr. Robot? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, Houston said, please do not call me Houston, Ro uh, Mr. Robot. He goes, I'm not a drug addict. I don't have mental illness. So. <laughs> but he filled up half of Reese's Cafe. So this was a real important way to create connections is with new students, with prior students. And, the, and, and, and our LA program was real wonderful for doing that as well. Um, this is the part that I missed, the creating this community game and we need to create <coughs> this interaction stuff. And then our, it's, it's the game part of it. And the game part of it really should look like this, bells and whistles, and that's why it's a work in progress. Because until we get it like that, we're not, what we're looking, I think, trying to do is to get the student to stay up all night playing video games, but to stay up all night on Java or whatever our course content is. How do we do that? Well, these bells and whistles aren't trivial. So I haven't figured that out. I'm still stuck with Angel Gradebook. But <laughs> I do have rules. I do have, we, I have to have very clear rules on how, you, on how this game works, how you earn points and so on. And you have to have metrics. Made a huge mistake the first time I rolled it out. I gave the, I gave the results when? At the end of the semester, when there's li literally nothing you can do. So this is, I'm telling you, this has taken years of, of, of fiddling with this around. So now we do this every five weeks. We give feedback to the students. If there's a disagreement, we can have a conversation. But rarely is there a, a disagreement. I can say very rarely out of thousands of students, maybe one. And it was an easy adjustment that we make. So that, those are some of the big uh, changes was don't ignore the game part of it if you're going to do this. These are pedagogies. And sometimes I think we, we, we get righteous and say, this is the only right way to do this. I literally use all three of these pedagogies in this semester. Sometimes I just have to lecture for 75 minutes for some content, some situations, time constraints, whatever. But I think what makes it nice is it's not 15 weeks of that. There's a little bit of a give and a take and a flow of the different <coughs> methods. So um, and the community game is, ask is actually asking students to bring the course into the world and the world into the course. And, and when you have a class with Jen, Ed, I expect that senior electrical engineering to be contributing in helping the freshman, the first year student uh, be successful. So I use all of these. It's not, a, it's not an either or kind of an event. Can anything go wrong with crowdsourcing mass collaboration in an undergraduate learning environment? What could go wrong? And Eileen's going, nope, nothing can go wrong. <laughs> exactly. Murphy tells us if something could go wrong, it will go wrong. This is a dish detergent company in Germany that, op that crowdsourced the label design for their product. And this is kind of <laughs> what I think they had in mind, was kind of a cute, happy label. The one that won was this one. <laughs> so if things can go wrong, they will just be aware of that. And for example, with this, it means I can't leave less active students behind. This, this game can't be a punishment or a disincentive for less active students. You have to realize in a large section, you're going to have a whole spectrum of learning profiles and you have to be inclusive to all of them. So uh, not everyone wants to talk in class. In particular, no one, very few people are comfortable speaking in front of 150 students. And Sage, what do we do? We stick the microphone in their face anyhow. <laughs> OK, so there, we have to be careful about uh, just being too crazy with this. Um, so you have to define your expectations, be transparent, focus on quality and the value reward. And that's the metric. That's the feedback part of it. And just be really patient and be persistent with it. I use a lot of tools in my classroom. A lot of us use combinations of these tools. Um, the one I wanted to emphasize here was this one. Is, uh, and this is a, a jab at the SRTE. The SRTE is our student feedback that we get. At, uh, we have some guests. So the SRTE is the feedback. That it's the grade that students give the teacher at the end of the semester. That doesn't help me with anything this semester. It doesn't even help me with next semester because there's a time delay before the results are released to us so we don't discriminate if we could recognize handwriting. <laughs> or, or, and we're, we're computer people. We can figure out. But, so they give it to us long enough later that we can't discriminate. So we can't even help us with next semester. It's literally a year later where it can actually be implemented. And in teaching, teaching time, that's too slow. So this was from one of my classes, one of my trainings with educational psychologists. They said, just do a minute survey. Do it every week. And I started that the first time. I had this when I was teaching in forum, 400 students. I'm like, how am I going to handle 400 little note cards coming down to the front of the room? So I divided the room into 40 groups of students. And over 10 different weeks, I sent those 40 students an email and said, can you just answer these three real simple questions? And I will tell you, if you do that, brace yourself. Students have no problem telling you what they think and how to improve and be better. 
They, and they don't need it to be anonymous to do this either. They're very, very vocal. They want and welcome that opportunity. So you have to have a thick skin, and I can still remember some of the comments that they made. They were absolutely correct, and I made tremendous changes as a result of that. So since I've been making so many changes for so long, I don't need to force students to do this. This is just one way that they can earn a community point. They can give me feedback at the end of the week. What was the be best thing you learned this week? What could be better explained or just general comments? Or they can give feedback on, on the quiz assessments. And we go through those and look at those. And every now and then it's an eye opener for me. It still happens, but it's just not like that avalanche the first time I started to do it. So this was one of the big things that helped increase the uh, SRTE. Uh, uh, teaching performance is measured by the SRTEs, which is one way to assess that performance. Uh, this is an example of a game that I use in SRI 111. This actually started as a community game. Just you get one point. There's lots of ways to get points. This was one, but it was so popular it actually become, became part of the graded semester uh, schedule. And it's a cryptography game. And I wanted to connect the students with the campus. I, I think it's a shame people that don't grow up here don't realize this wonderful history here. We've got these great markers. I'm always stopping and reading them and I'm just amazed. So this game has two parts to it. The first is a dictionary cipher where you use the, the, uh, um, the blue markers. Will you, the clues will tell you what words to take off the markers and concatenate those together to form a keyword. And then we use a visionaire cipher to take this gobbledygook kind of string and it's saved the bar because when it's translated or decrypted, it's a Shakespeare quote. And so for, uh, it's, it's, just, it's just a fun game, and students love cryptography, and I'm like, gosh, we don't really do cryptography in ISD, but they love it so much. I'm like, okay, sometimes you just got to go with what the flow is, and that was, that was what that was. But it also connects with the, with the uh, campus. We're actually doing this one this week right now. So here's in the syllabus, and this has been for about two years now. This is the last page of the syllabus. There's all these different ways you can improve points. And the real test is, does it improve peer learning? And they're not limited to these ways here. Um, there's, it's pretty much begins with you have to have attendance and then, and then be prepared to participate. Sometimes it's voluntary and sometimes it's cold calling. But there's just lots of different ways to, to earn points. And it's a silly little game, and it doesn't have bells or whistles. But it's my way to take 150 students in a section and try and make it seem like a really small, intimate class. And that is my whirlwind introduction to the community game that I use in the College of IST. Thank you. <laughs> yes, there we go. So we can now, I think we have some time. We have plenty of time. We should have some. Yes, we have some time for questions. So, who would like to add? Yes. I was telling you things today that are horrible, and I was telling you things today, each section that you, or each uh, course that you <laughs> teach, and I'm asking you three questions at once. <laughs> <laughs> and thirdly, how much do you bury the course during the time of teaching it? How much, yeah, okay, so the three questions. How much time do I prepare for a course? How much time do I pr prepare for the section in advance? And then how, do I bury it during the semester? Those are three excellent questions. Um, the interesting thing, I, I, I have to answer it a couple of different ways. I just developed a new online class for graduate students in risk. I spent a year implementing that class, even though it was, work that I had done pr prior, but it took a full year to convert it and implement it. And, that, and this is with support from the wonderful instructional designers in the College of IST. If it's a course that, I've, that I teach semester to semester, the prep time at the beginning of the semester is probably a week because this is student feedback. They said they want PowerPoint, they want course packs, they want the notes that they can buy in a bookstore for $20 and take their notes. They told me their wrists got too tired. And I'm like, I think I was at college for four years. I didn't get a tired wrist, so maybe my wrist was in better shape then. <laughs> but they wanted the notes ahead of time. So, so it takes a week to convert and improve. And I'm taking notes every class, fix this, add this. So it takes about a week, only a week for a class that I've taught before to get it up and running for the following semester, assuming there's no major changes. But I, this is an interesting, and it, it wasn't, directly one of the questions you asked, how much time do I spend preparing for each hour in the classroom? I spend about three hours, and it doesn't matter if I've taught that class once or for 10 years. 
in the College of Business, I taught MIS 204 for years, and it's still, every hour I went in to teach, it's, I spent three hours preparing, um, which I thought was a crazy amount of time, but that's basically for me what it boiled down to. So, <laughs> yes? I have a question, though. On the student critique of the room, two questions. Are the critiques c consistent, and is there a gender difference? The some of these, Mar I think Mary Beth sees more of the results on gender than I do. I don't get that kind of feedback. Um, but I can tell you, this is a fascinating thing about the SRTs. There's only so much that we can control. I have taught two of the exact same classes to the exact same demographic back to back and got two completely different SRTEs. Different being half a point different. Um, and I'm like, okay, so there's only so much, there's going to be uh, flexibility in the results. And that's why it's not a pure <coughs> definition of teaching effectiveness. But it is an indicator. But yeah, so you will have a range based on that. So one of the many emails that circulated among the faculty that I thought was very appropriate to your talk is the one about 42. And um, so I'm just curious what you think the limits would be on students teaching themselves or what you think about this whole model of learning. Uh, um, is this like the flipped and high? I'm actually a couple days behind on the email. I was here last night, and that's why I this candy was Deep. my dinner last night. Um, is this about, are you talking about the flipped and hybrid, the limits for that? Or no, no, no. Who wants to? I, I know Jack knows about it. So, Jack, you want to just go quickly? Yeah, yeah. Was it? <laughs> I think, I think I saw James's response to your email, but I haven't actually seen your email yet. I can just yet. summarize it as it's self-study. So there's a lot of resources available. The kids all come together in a room, like a big lab. Uh, okay. And then they sit there and they work on stuff and they ask each other, they grade each other's work. And they're, it's, it's very game-like in the yeah. sense that they're working through levels. They're trying to get to certain levels of accomplishment. So, yeah. I think that's what I understood, anyway. I, I th and, I th and I think it was James's response to your email that I saw, and I didn't get far enough down yet to find the original email yet. But I, but I, but the some of the comments in his ma email I, I agree with, and, and I'm seeing this with my large sections. Is there you have a spectrum of students, and for the high, and for the top, the higher earner students, it's not going to be a problem. They will definitely take advantage of that. In fact, when I was teaching in the forum, I subtly encouraged or permitted students not to be there. Not just physically because you couldn't take attendance, because when you have four, when they would come in to take a test in the forum, all 400, the room's temperature would go up 10 degrees. It physically became uncomfortable for everybody. Mm -hmm. So that, those 20% or whatever of that 400 that were kind of doing it independently, I, I, I know it can be done. But you, and, and it's something I wrestle with from the flipped and hybrid perspective. Actually, it's something I'm thinking about with 311. And M Wilma Gill had gone uh, completely to, uh, hybrid on that, but but is it something that I should make the content available and just have classes for the 30 or 40 percent that want the hands-on? Um, my daughter was in Will's class when he completely <coughs> flipped it, and she said, I, I kind of would prefer to have an opportunity to meet with him every week. So I, I think it's a spectrum, and I think that's why it's going to be hard to say one size fits all. But it does, it is a very interesting thought, and I think a lot of this, this disruption began with the MOOCs, and I think we're just seeing this playing its, its way out right now. I think it's a very exciting time to be in teaching. Hi, Ed. I just want to follow that up on your role in the online uh, environment here in IST. You've taken a real leadership role with your coordinator role as the um, MTS in IS coordinator. Um, you've taught online and you also give a lot of your uh, brain power to new ideas for online. So maybe you could talk a little bit about any of the transition of what it was like teaching from the classroom to an online. Now that's, a, that's a good question also. When I, the first time I taught online was because this was a new frontier and I wanted to see what it was and what it was about. It actually had a huge impact on how I taught in residence. And in fact, I'm able to f uh, flip parts of the semester now because I have content s and because of that. So yeah, it's had a huge impact with me. What, what Amy said, 
Mary Beth mentioned that I'm, I support the MPS, our master's degree online in enterprise architecture because of my business background and, and engineering background. But I'm also the coordinator for our cybersecurity master's degree online and work with those, those programs and those faculty. And uh, for me, it started out just as what is this online thing? I had no idea that it was going to change how I'm able to do stuff in residence because of that. And, and again, it's just being familiar with new technologies and these instructional crazy designer people have so much insight yeah. <laughs> into this stuff. And um, so that was a real opportunity for that, just to take that out. And it doesn't hurt that World Campus in, in our field is rated number one in the world for online teaching. So we get a lot of attention and respect for that. In fact, a lot of work, right, Amy, because we have to spend weeks going through all of the applications for uh, some of these programs. It's a, it's a real positive thing uh, to do that. Well, I knew Allison was going to ask a hard one. She I saved the hard <laughs> and the big bomb. <laughs> no, no, it's not hard. Thank you for your talk. That was great. Um, I appreciate how you talked about generational differences and seeing students come through. Something I struggle with in the classroom is whether I allow them to use technology in the classroom, their own laptops or phones. I have seen it being productive in the sense that they're taking notes or they're looking up related things that then they contribute to the conversation and then other times they're on Facebook or doing things they shouldn't be doing. Have you seen this in the classroom at all, whether or not um, we should restrict the technology, whether we should allow it? What's your advice on that? I did an experiment um, one semester I just said, you know, you're telling me this is the way it should be. Uh, go, go for it for one semester. It was a huge fiasco. <laughs> it was an unmitigated disaster. I had a guest speaker came in who I thought would never, ever come back and guest speak. He was so, it was so disruptive to the learning. So, and that was, I mean, I was trying to be open-minded about it and everything, but I thought this is not working. And, and, and maybe what the solution is is to go to a flipped or hybrid environment. It's like, why should I make you come in here for me to to have this conversation. You don't want to necessarily take advantage of the in-class activities, some of you, so um, maybe the solution is to, is to just, you know, work it that way. But, but my, and, and there's actually uh, good literature that support this as well. Uh, the students have the belief that they can multitask, and we know that that's not true. But I don't tell them that. What I say is, you're disrupting me. You're, you're distracting me. That's why you can't do that because it distracts me. I don't want to go and have the debate, so we, we kind of get beyond the disagreement about whether you can multitask or not and just move forward and say, it, 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 I literally lose my train of thought because <laughs> in the room, I'm studying everybody's faces, 150 students. <laughs> and when I come over to the room and their head's down and they're doing this, I was like, I actually go, what are they doing? It's really interesting. I want to go, <laughs> human nature, go look over their shoulder. So that's, that's my reaction. But what I do do is I have a technology-free zone. It's the first two rows in the cybertorium. And if you want to sit down there, and for a lot of people that's painful to go to the first two rows just because they want to have their laptop. But I've been really cranky this week. This is a tough week for me to be winning this award. <laughs> <laughs> I blame the Ohio State game. I don't know. If, have, you, have you had the same? Can we get a pulse in the classroom? I had a student, I teach in the cybertorium as well, and I had 150 students, and, and he said, I thought all the professors were going to let us go this <laughs> week because we, we <laughs> Ohio State. <laughs> okay. Hi, Ed. Hello, Lisa. <laughs> I know you are a, an avid user of the learning assistant program, and I think that that's probably one way that you make that community game work. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about um, the role that they play and how you interface with those students to bring them into the, the IST teaching community as well? I'm a very aggressive learner of the IST's wonderful learning assistant program, which is very unique in undergraduate education. And what it is is, is students that have completed a class <laughs> and and met certain requirements of GPA and, and performance, can be come back as, as paid or credit volunteers to support the next group. I actually started doing this in the College of Business. That one picture up there with community was actually teaching interns when I was in the College of Business. And it wasn't paid, it was, it basically it was our coaches is what it was. Um, 
I, had, I was very competitive uh, with six students um, for two semesters. The f first semester you did one credit to see whether we liked you and whether you liked us, and then you would come back the second semester for two credits and, and mentor and train. And so I'm, I'm always into this uh, training, training, mentoring. And, and so when I came to, L to IST and they were doing this, I'm like, wow, this is the best thing in the world. So very aggressive with bringing back these wonderful students uh, to help. And it's real simple. Um, I'm like the Maytag repairman in my office hours. No one comes. And part of it's, you know, convenience, but part of it's because they're afraid of the faculty. And so the single biggest thing I do with the learning assistants is they have office hours. And, and they have office hours when it's convenient for the students. And just after class, some students came down because have, they have office hours right after class. They flew right by me to the LA that was having office hours and said, let's go, we're going out. And I'm like, what about me? <laughs> but this is, a, this is a faculty preference too because we've been in meetings where faculty said, I don't want, I'm the expert. You talk to me if you have a question and that's, and that's a choice that some people make. But, but this LA program and these, and these students and, and Sages uh, and, and Lauren, I see Lauren up there too, are wonderful examples of our student leaders and that they're able to come back and give their time and mentorship and leadership to the next generation. We are all the time, especially with me teaching the levels that I do, the, um, the new students to Penn State, we are attracting students like crazy to IST. It, it's probably once a week I'm sending a student over to Jean, Jeannie's not here, but uh, Jeannie's office is right across the walkway, go down the stairs, make an appointment. Look at the website first, but, but we're just a steady flow of students that are going, I didn't know what this was before. I really think this is what I should be doing. And we're attracting them from engineering and business and a lot of different majors of uh, really good students. So that's because of the LA program, Lisa. That's the real value is uh, the LAs are able to, to bring that value. have experience in technical courses and r let's say non-technical courses. Does, how much of this approach that you have taken applies in the technical courses, which traditionally, and at least in my old days, uh, were strictly lecture? And can you translate all this to those kind of courses or are they only applicable to the more non-technical courses? Yeah, every, and, and, and Dean McMurtry <coughs> is talking about as an undergraduate engineering student where there was one pedagogy, it was called Sage on the Stage, and it was effective. Um, I have no regrets, no remorse. I, I mean, we learned to do what we did, I thought, very well. And I, and I have the PE title after my name, so I took it. I was a, that was an engineering professor Professor Heinsohn that said, you need to go and get this degree, you need to go get this certificate. It was a pain in the butt <laughs> to get it, but, but, but he was absolutely right. So everyone, it's not just the nature of the course, it's also the nature of the professor. And every course is a little bit different, but I think there's an opportunity for all of this mixture. We have Chris Gamrat over here who was my undergraduate, I'm on his, on his dissertation committee right now. He was an undergraduate student for me in business in a programming class. It was uh, Visual Basic. And, and there, was, there was similar elements of this peer review. I think we peer reviewed the assignments. Uh, we just would switch seats and, and, and get another set of eyes. Basically what I'm trying to teach them is you don't have to have me do this. You go get someone else to look at your work. And then the last assignment, we just pushed them out on their own. Instead of me giving you the, the uh, programming assignment, why don't you go out, find an end user, uh, elicit a, a problem and identify it and then program a solution for it. So go through the whole system development life cycle from beginning to end. So in that regard, it was pretty effective. Um, so I, it's, 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 I just don't think it's probably not likely that you can do any of these pedagogies 100% from beginning to end. I think that's whenever you might run into some issues is trying to one size fits all. It really has to m meet the, uh, the faculty members' uh, um, personality and beliefs. But I don't think it's necessarily because of the nature of the course that you go one way or the other. Other questions, comments? I didn't know there was going to be some. I wasn't prepared for questions. <laughs> <laughs>
I thought the food was after him. He'd like to be a <laughs> mad rush. He wants to get you out to the food. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, if there are no more questions, let's thank him one more time. I, I just have just one more thing. These strangers down here, you didn't meet yet. This is my oldest brother, Paul, <laughs> who came up. This is not the brother, brother that I grew up with. <laughs> <laughs> but he's an Eagle Scout. <laughs> And his wife, Linda, and they came up from Mechanicsburg just for this. Linda is an educator. She's still, she's still, she can't retire. They won't let her retire. They won't let her retire. And this is my oldest daughter, Candace, who's a nurse at, at Mount Nittany. I'm very proud of her, too. Thank you.